Christmas, you might have noticed, is almost here. And despite the coldish weather this weekend, it's not likely that you and I will experience a Crosby-ish white Christmas this Christmas. Open fires are rare these days, almost as rare as chestnuts to roast them over, and Jack Frost rarely visits North Florida. As much as we might try to emulate the pictures on the few Christmas cards we have received, for Christmas cards also are becoming a thing of the past, we will not manage to look like those figures out of Dickens' Christmas Carol. It's hard to look Dickensian while wearing t-shirts and a pair of shorts. This will be a Florida Christmas draped in Spanish moss. And perhaps it's just as well. Too many of us already put far too much effort in trying to achieve the unachievable, the perfect Christmas. No matter how hard we try, how carefully we plan, something can go wrong and usually does. A wise teacher of worship has written that Perfectionism is the enemy of good worship, and the same can be said of Christmas. The harder we try to do it perfectly, the more likely we are to miss the point. Today's reading from the Gospel of Luke scatters us proud perfectionists in the imagination of our hearts. For as you and I are getting ready for one kind of Christmas. Elizabeth and Mary are preparing for a different kind of Christmas altogether. What do you suppose prompts Mary to leave Joseph back in Nazareth and go into the hill country to visit her older sister Elizabeth? Could it be the knowing looks of her neighbors as word gets round about her pregnancy? The whispers in the doorways, the silent but severe reproaches. Nazareth was a good-sized city, but sometimes, like Tallahassee, it can feel like quite a small town. Maybe Mary needs to get away. Or perhaps, as John Calvin speculated, the thrill of the angel's visit to Mary may have worn off by now, and she might be going to Elizabeth to confide that she's not so sure things are going to be so wonderful after all. Despite the angel's visit, maybe she needs to see Elizabeth to pour out her misgivings. After all, Elizabeth is also carrying a child conceived under miraculous circumstances. The angel told Mary all about it. Maybe Mary needs to see that miracle for herself. If so, Calvin suggests, Mary should be commended. He writes, There is nothing we should reckon odd in Mary seeking to confirm her faith by going to see the miracle which the angel had effectively brought to her notice. The faithful may be satisfied with the unadored, unadorned word of God, and yet neglect none of his works which they recognize provide support for their faith. Mary was above all right to seize upon the help offered her. So maybe she's going to confirm her faith, or maybe she's going to offer Elizabeth some encouragement. There is Elizabeth out in the hill country, the wife of a country priest, an old man who cannot talk, a real visit from our cousin might help her, boost her up, give her an encouraging word. Not a text message, mind you. Not a tweet, but a visit. Not a Facebook post, a real live hug and a kiss. A good chin wag over several cups of tea. This is the kind of thing that 
You can't simulate in pixels the kind of thing that women are quite good at to their everlasting credit. It's interesting to me that Luke does not say that Joseph went to find a pal to pour out his concerns and his worries about the pregnancy and the future they had together. Interesting, but not surprising. I'll bet the thought never occurred to Luke. But before Mary can get through the door, as soon as she calls out, Elizabeth, the child within Elizabeth's body, gave a good cook and she was filled with the Holy Spirit and her heart was overflowing and she knew. Mary too has had a visit from an angel. She too is a willing participant in a plan to bring good news to all people. Mary's in on it. This wild, improbable scheme of God to bring salvation to the whole world. When something like that happens to you, when the penny drops and you realize that God is working in your life to your good and the good of the, all the world, what do you do? What do you do with your joy and your wonder that God would bother with the likes of you? I'll tell you what Elizabeth does. She sings. Her aged voice cracks a little and there's plenty of vibrato, but the message comes through loud and clear. Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. That song makes Elizabeth the very first evangelist, the first bearer of the good news. It's also what makes the Christmas Elizabeth and Mary anticipate different from the one that you and I tend to wait for. We tend to wait for a generic and domesticated Christmas, a politically correct season of peace and goodwill, something that will fit comfortably on the, under the banner of happy holidays, something that gives no offense but that's not what causes the child to leap in, in Elizabeth's womb for joy. It's not what makes this aged mother sing out in geriatric exultation. No, the good news Elizabeth sings about is specific, particular, scandalously offensive. It's not just any child, but this child. It's not just any womb, but the womb of Mary, a peasant girl from a dusty town called Nazareth, a young woman with no status, no standing, and no future so far as anyone could see. We forget sometimes amidst the incessant carols and the PA system in the mall and the Santa-themed ads on TV that Christmas like Easter is a scandal and a stumbling block, or at least it should be. It defies all notions of a distant God who either doesn't care about the mess we've made of things or whose hands are tied by some immutable rules of divine behavior. Christmas is about incarnation about God becoming one of us, about the Word becoming flesh. Not just flesh in general, but flesh in the womb of this young woman, this nobody, this female, who has no claim to power or wealth or influence. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Mary. A few hundred years into the Christian tradition, we got a little off track in regards to Mary, I think. The church decided that the best way to honor her was to create a doctrine of immaculate conception and perpetual virginity, thus placing Mary high on a pedestal. That, of course, was the idea of male theologians 
who thought it was a good idea to keep Mary unsullied by the ordinary experience of real women. Ironically, this long tradition of Marian piety has made Mary more plaster saint than flesh and blood woman. The more special she became, the less human she became, which makes the fruit of her womb less human as well. Mary is truly blessed, but blessed in her full humanity, which includes, to the embarrassment of male theologians, her full sexuality. Elizabeth, the first evangelist, sings not about Mary's purity and sinlessness, but about the joy that comes with God's call to bear God's light into the world, to carry in her very human body God's grace and mercy made flesh. Prompted by Elizabeth's song, Mary also breaks forth in her own song, and hers is a song about great reversals, about a world turned upside down, as we just sang. A world where the powerful are brought low and the powerless high, a world where the hungry are filled with good things and the rich sent away empty, a world where refugees do not crowd onto boats overloaded and drowned toddlers are not washed up on the beach, a world where the sons and daughters of immigrants remember their own heritage and open wide arms of welcome, a world where mercy trumps cynicism and reason is not held hostage to fear. So confident is Mary that the world that she sings about is coming, that she sings in the past tense as though it has already happened. And what is it that makes her so sure? The promise of the God who keeps promises. The mercy of the God who remembers God's mercy. The power of the God who is willing to come into the world as a helpless baby growing right now in Mary's womb. That world is coming and nothing can stop it. Not King Herod's raging, not Caesar's cross, not the fear baiting rants of demagogues who are running for high office, not the assaults of those who call themselves blessed because they bring death instead of life. As we sing the songs of the culture's Christmas, let us not neglect the songs of Elizabeth and Mary. One evokes visions of jingle bells and sugar plums. The other foresees a new world coming forth by the birth pangs of an ordinary woman who receives an extraordinary blessing from God. The songs of these women are the true songs of Christmas. May God grant us voices to sing what they sing and eyes to see what they see. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.